If you picture the Scottish Highlands, it probably looks something like this. A barren, treeless landscape. And for the most part, you'd be right. But the Highlands have a secret. A forgotten landscape that once covered much of the country. Today, only small pieces of it remain, hiding in the deepest canyons and most remote woodlands. This is Scotland's temperate rainforest. In a country famous for its grand vistas, Scotland's rainforests are characterized by the details. This bizarre miniature world of organisms found nowhere else. These forests inspired ancient folklore thousands of years ago, Victorian stories of gothic horror and mystery, and the artists of the Romantic movement. I knew that I had to see this little-known landscape for myself, so let's climb some big mountains, look at some tiny plants, get absolutely pummeled by rain, and explore the mysterious past and uncertain future of Scotland's rainforests. Before we get going, I want to quickly thank Headspace for sponsoring this video. This video is about temperate rainforests, and these landscapes are special to me because I live in one, the Appalachian Temperate Rainforest. For several years, this has been a wonderful place for finding quiet and focus, focusing entirely on my breathing, putting one foot in front of the other, and the sounds around me. This practice of finding quiet and focus has become an important part of my life. I've made entire videos about it, and it's why I was excited to partner with Headspace on this one. Practicing meditation or mindfulness can be a bit awkward at first, you might not know quite how to do it, or it can be difficult to stick with it consistently. Headspace helps to remove those barriers, providing an accessible resource for exploring different ways of connecting with your mental wellness. They have more than a thousand pieces of content guided meditations and breathing exercises, as well as resources for improving focus and sleep. It's a resource that's helping me to make meditation and mindfulness a consistent daily practice, as well as just helping me to stay focused while I'm writing or editing. Whether you're completely new and want to give it a try, or you have some experience but want to explore some new methods, Headspace is a great resource. You can try it out completely free for 60 days by using the link in the description of this video or by scanning the QR code on screen. Thank you to Headspace for supporting this project and just for making something important to me more accessible. It's thanks to sponsors like Headspace that I can go on these trips, tell these stories. So thank you again. And now, well, I think you can infer. Does Scotland having rainforest sound? kind of weird at first and then you step outside and feel a little bit of the weather and it just makes perfect sense, honestly. The Scottish Highlands make up this northernmost section of the British Isles. During the last ice age, Scotland was buried under glaciers, sliding across the earth and carving the cliffs and valleys you see today. As the ice age ended, the glaciers retreated and the climate became milder and rainier allowing trees to advance north and colonize the land. That mild and rainy climate is most prominent along the west coast, allowing for the development of a lush, temperate rainforest. This zone with a suitable climate for rainforest covers about a fifth of the British Isles, reaching its pinnacle in Scotland. When Britain's forests fully developed around 6,000 years ago, much of this zone probably would have been blanketed in lush, temperate rainforests. Evidence of a past rainforest is buried in another iconic Scottish landscape, peat bogs, formed when dead vegetation slowly accumulates in successive layers. The resulting peat is compact and low in oxygen, slowing decomposition and preserving the organic matter within it for thousands of years. The vertical accumulation of peat creates a stratified history of past ecosystems stretching back as far as the last ice age and recording evidence of a rainforest once covering much of Scotland's west coast. Today, this rainforest survives in small pockets, on the edges of lakes and the ocean, or hiding on steep hillsides and in deep gorges. Scotland's glacial history has carved a landscape of big, impressive vistas, but its rainforests only reveal themselves if you're willing to look closer. They're small patches of oak, pine, holly, birch, hazel, and ash, among other trees. They're ancient, but they're tiny, trimmed and warped by strong winds from the ocean. 
but to know that you're in a rainforest, you'll need to look even smaller. These forests support over a dozen species of ferns, 160 mosses and liverworts, and about 500 species of lichen. Dead trees support hundreds of species of insects and fungi, including vast underground networks branching out and allowing these trees to communicate. This forest was once home to a vast variety of birds, along with elk, lynx, wolves, and wildcats. But much of its ecological magic is found in this miniature world of epiphytes, plants that grow on other plants, only possible in the rainiest places. When the Ice Age ended and trees started colonizing Britain, humans followed right behind. For as long as these forests have been here, people have lived among them. Around 3,000 years ago, the Celts migrated into Britain. Their history is pretty cloudy. They didn't leave their own written records, and much of what was written about them is secondhand from Greek and Roman documents. Greek writings describe them as an educated group of fierce warriors and philosophers who spoke in riddles and could see the future. In the first century AD, Romans invaded Britain and encountered Druids, a caste of Celtic priests who held these forests sacred and associated them with religious rituals. The invading Romans named Scotland the Great Wood of Caledon, writing of a vast, impenetrable forest in the north. Newer evidence suggests that this vast, unbroken forest probably didn't exist, and that it's possible the Roman army just made it up as an excuse to not try to settle this very harsh region. Celtic mythology helped to inspire the Mabinogion, a collection of Welsh folklore over a thousand years old, one of the oldest British texts. It tells stories of Welsh rainforests, including a rainforest wizard sending an army of trees to fight off beasts from another realm. These rainforests made their way into Victorian-era horror stories as the home of Celtic sacrifices, fairies, the devil, and portals to another realm. In 1901, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle visited an English rainforest and drew inspiration for the third Sherlock Holmes book, The Hound of the Baskervilles, which features descriptions of a spooky rainforest landscape. And these forests inspired the writers and painters of the Romantic movement, who found beauty not only in Scotland's grand vistas, but its rainy climate and the details of its forests. Among the first was William Wordsworth, writing in detail about the beauty of the Lake District's rainforests. Around 6,000 years ago, right after these rainforests reached their final form, hunter-gatherers in Britain started farming, clearing the surrounding forests to make room. It's probably around the same time that sheep were first introduced, grazing the previously forested land. Large predators like wolves eat sheep, so shepherds started aggressively hunting them out. The Bronze Age and then Iron Age brought better tools, and over the next several thousand years, more and more of this forest was cleared. In the 11th century AD, William the Conqueror invaded and took control of England. He liked to hunt deer and began setting aside large sections of land as royal forests, places where hunting, trapping, herding, and logging were all banned for the sole purpose of protecting the deer population so that he could hunt them. That idea trickled down to the aristocracy of the time, who started setting aside their own private parks. At their height, these royal forests covered about a third of England, and in a sense, they had come kind of close to accidentally creating the first national parks, just for all the wrong reasons. The idea didn't go much further, but the aristocracy's obsession with deer hunting definitely did. In the second half of the 1700s, British aristocrats began moving into the Scottish Highlands, pushing the native Highlanders out in the process. 
restricting their clan system, banning tartans and bagpipe music, suppressing the Gaelic language, and evicting thousands from their land, replacing them with sheep. Those evicted were resettled on infertile land, barely getting by. And in 1846, the potato blight brought disease and starvation, with many Highlanders moving to factories in the cities or leaving the country entirely to work as indentured servants abroad. Eventually, the land was completely degraded and grazing sheep had become unprofitable, so wealthy landowners converted much of the highlands into massive hunting estates. They imported game, mainly deer, and shelter for that game, mainly rhododendron. Wealthy Victorian estate owners loved to hunt, but they also loved to garden and sent plant collectors to remote forests to find exotic ferns to display in their greenhouses. The Industrial Revolution saw the rise of a British middle class, now with the money to garden for themselves, and it's from this interest in gardening that we get what in 1855 was termed teratomania, fern madness. Thousands flocking to the rainforests in search of exotic ferns to take home and display in their homes and gardens. Rainforesty corners of Britain were nicknamed Fern Country, Fern Land, Fern Paradise. Fern guidebooks were flying off the shelves. Ferns inspired art, architecture, and cookie designs. Thousands of collectors cutting and digging up plants did noticeable damage to the ecosystem, and in 1896, two people were sentenced to several weeks of hard labor for swiping ferns from a British rainforest. In 1925, shortly after the fern frenzy settled down, two aristocrats bought a large chunk of temperate rainforest in the south of Britain. This time, the estate wasn't for hunting or gardening. It was a business. They started experimenting with new forestry techniques, looking for the best way to make money off of timber. Within a decade, they developed a system, clearing these scrubby, unprofitable rainforests and replacing them with conifers, mainly Sitka spruce. These trees were imported from the Pacific Northwest, and they thrived in this climate, growing faster and larger than the native species, and blocking light and snuffing out the mosses and lichens that make this ecosystem unique. After the Second World War, Britain wanted to beef up their timber reserves, so this system became a standard, with government subsidies incentivizing the replacement of native forests with conifer plantations. And in the decades following the war, an estimated one-third of Britain's remaining ancient forests were cleared out. Today, the landscape bears the scars. The Sitka spruce is the most common tree in Scotland, standing in strange, patchy plantations. Native forests exist in small patches, but they aren't what they used to be. Dozens of native species have been driven out, and invasive imports have taken over. Sheep and deer eat saplings, and rhododendron chokes out native undergrowth, preventing the forest from regrowing. Hiding in plain sight are the ghost woods, preserved in peat bogs, forest-related place names, and lone trees hanging on. And in places like the highlands, with many of the original inhabitants driven out, degradation of the landscape has gone largely unnoticed. But that doesn't have to be the end of this story. The spark that initially led me to these rainforests wasn't their history, but their future. It was thumbing through National Geographic and seeing this headline about Scotland potentially becoming the first rewilded country. Rewilding is a conservation theory focused on restoring ecosystems to a state of self-sustainability. That usually means working across large areas and focusing on restoring the natural structures and processes that make those landscapes work. Central to rewilding is the idea of keystone species, species with an outsized role in the ecosystem. Oftentimes, these are large predators at the top of the food chain, essentially keeping the species below them in check. Keystone species theory suggests that the removal of these species can result in a domino effect, where a few species explode and many others go extinct. It also suggests the reverse, that the reintroduction of a keystone species will often restore much of the ecosystem's function. Over the last few decades, these ideas have really been gaining steam in Scotland. The result has been decreased grazing of sheep and increased culling of deer. 
fewer government subsidies for grazing more sheep and increasing output, and more for planting native species and protecting the environment. Protection and restoration of ancient woodlands, the designation of Scotland's first national parks, and countrywide efforts to connect existing wild places. One of the biggest challenges is fragmentation. Many of Scotland's wild places, like its rainforests, exist in patches separated by farms, estates, and tree plantations. And even today, about half of Scotland's land area is private estates held by about 600 people, many of them still managed for hunting. Fortunately, some estates have switched teams, conducting restoration projects on their grounds, and a couple are even aiming to make the first reintroduction of Scotland's keystone species, wolves. That's a move that's been met with some pushback. Scotland's rainforests are undoubtedly endangered, but they have a chance. A chance to be not a rare landscape, but a rare example of a landscape that bounced back. When you think of vast, wild places, you might picture Alaska or Patagonia. Scotland probably isn't the first place to come to mind. But just like its hidden rainforests, Scotland has a hidden legacy. Among the earliest environmentalists were the Romantics. Artists like William Wordsworth didn't just depict beautiful landscapes, they criticized their destruction at the hands of early industrialization. And among the Romantics' earliest inspirations were the ancient woods and glacier-carved cliffs of the Scottish Highlands. Back home in the States, our temperate rainforests survive largely thanks to our own Romantic artist, John Muir, whose writings about forests and glaciers galvanized the American conservation movement. Despite this inseparability from the American landscape, Muir was a Scotsman, and his love for wild places didn't start in Alaska or Yosemite, but during a childhood in the Scottish countryside. Scotland is only one country, and a small one at that. But they seem to have an outsized impact when it comes to inspiring appreciation for beautiful and wild places. Today, it seems they have an opportunity to do that again. <laughs> 